thank you all for coming out to the Richmond Art Center this afternoon. It is a time of deep sorrow for all of us as these fires are raging through our beautiful, beautiful lands and destroying homes and security of so many and cruelly claiming lives and shattering the lives of those who have lost those they love. Um, at the Art Center, we are especially saddened by the toll on our artists in our community. Their studios and artwork have been wiped out. We look at the monumental works of Clifford Rainey calling us to face the impact that we have on other creatures. We regard this champion whose land restoration project we viewed with pleasure last week and today we avert our gaze knowing it has been destroyed as fire swept across his property and ravaged his house and his sculpture studio, destroying all his work. We are surrounded by the cautionary tales of Chester Arnold, who has been evacuated and awaits the fate of his home and his work. Um, we have seats here that are empty and we are thinking about those artists who could not be with us today, and we share in their grief and loss. In picturing the environment, the artists in the exhibition Earth, Wind, and Fire have seen themselves in the world, in nature, in the elements, and they have rendered this in a multitude of materials. Across many platforms, painting, printmaking, sculpture, video, and cyberspace. They have held a mirror to our lives and just what our habits have cost the environment. We are fortunate to have these strong and clear voices to reflect nature and our nature, that we may be moved and then hopefully that we will be able to move wisely forward. Um, we're very sorry that um, the other artists couldn't be with us. I would like to introduce to you Kim Anno, who is a painter, a photographer, film, and video artist. Her work has been exhibited by museums nationally and internationally, including the San Jose, uh, the San Francisco, excuse me, San Francisco Asian Art Museum, site. Santa Fe Biennial, the Varnasi Museum in Hungary, DC Düsseldorf International Expo, Pulse Miami, and even our own Berkeley Art Museum. Anno's work is included in the collections of SF MoMA, the Berkeley Art Museum, Honolulu Academy of Fine Arts Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, Crocker Museum of Art, Oakland Museum, Columbia University Library, and the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles, among many others. A professor of California, at the California College of the Arts, Kim Anno's recent interests have focused on the intersection of art and science, particularly in aesthetic issues surrounding climate change, water, and adaptation. Um, Jenny O'Dell is a multidisciplinary artist based in Oakland. Her work has been exhibited at the Contemporary Jewish Museum, Google Headquarters, Les Rencontres d'Art, Feu Museum Antwerpen, La Gaieté Lyrique in Paris, the Li Xu Photography Festival in China, Apex Art New York, and East Wing in Dubai. This humorous and very serious work has been featured in Time Magazine's Lightbox, The Atlantic, The Economist, and Wired. Odell has been an artist in residency at Recology, the San Francisco Dumps Artist in Residency Program, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the Palo Alto Art Center, Facebook, and Internet Archive. Jenny O'Dell teaches internet art and digital physical design at Stanford. As she claims she would spend 80% of her life in a library if she could, we are very glad to have her here in Richmond <laughs> at the Richmond Art Center today. 
Thank you so much to both of you for being here. And I thought perhaps we could start out um, these being you know, very difficult times and um, being very concerned about what's happening right in the moment. If you could in turn talk a little bit about um, what some of the, the impetus was for the way in which you entered the work that you're doing. Would you like to start there? Um, so I have um, a couple of, or I have three pieces over here, um, but I guess they all kind of came from a similar feeling, which I've actually, yeah, I've been thinking about a lot lately, just um, with how much everyone is thinking about air right now, and it's air is just not something that you think about um, almost ever. Um, it, so for me, it's this feeling of, of alienation, so being alienated from experience like direct experiences of of a landscape but also what the effects are that I'm having on a landscape so I understand when I throw something away that it goes through a, a series of processes and probably ends up in a landfill but I have really no way of visualizing that so um, especially the this, the garbage selfie that I have here on the left which is made out of three weeks of my own trash um, and then this piece next to it, which is um, an attempt to find the manufacturing origins of every single thing that I interacted with, like ate or bought or, or used um, in one day in the order that I sort of used them. Um, those are both kind of this attempt to make that a little bit more concrete. They're, um, they're sort of aspirational, like I, I, it's, I, I didn't never really got to the bottom of it in, in either case, but it is like motivated by this feeling of trying to make something real that is real, but just make it feel real or make it more real to myself. Yeah. So you're asking me my, about my motivations. Yes, I, I, I mean, when, uh, first of all, I think when, when you make decisions as an artist mm -hmm. to, um, put your energies into something mm -hmm. and you um, are focused on a particular theme or particular mm -hmm. um, incident that spurs um, a direction in your work, you're making a lot of really important choices and maybe you could um, illuminate some of the things that brought you to those kinds of decisions in terms of your work. Well, I could say that um, I had been making paintings for 25 years, and in 2009, I started to look um, very closely with a lot of my students and my young friends about what was happening in the environment, the pace of it. Not that it, I wasn't aware of it before. It was, it was much more that I had been in my peripheral vision, and then the, the, the speed at which the change was happening was so fast and I was like oh my god you know as sort of a wake up and I thought what does this mean this must mean something for me as an artist not just an activist I'm an environmental activist but not just that but as an artist what can I do and what is the best voice that I could have and at that time I decided that I wanted to get involved much more with um, film and cinema and collaborating with musicians, for instance. And um, I'm very interested in not just having a rarefied audience, but having a mass audience and really having much more direct communication with people that I never would have before. It seemed like my work was being collected um, by museums and very wealthy people. and. That was all fine and good and good for me, but um, what was it doing in the greater scheme of things? And I started to realize, oh, I gotta do something. I, I just have to do something. I have to change my focus. And not that it's either or, but um, certainly much more of my energy is, is working towards having a, an audience that's somewhat younger demographic, a more mainstream demographic, I know I went to this talk um, recently by this man who's, who was studying arts audiences. And, and he was like looking at statistics like at the Pew and a few other foundations. And he was really communicating about how the art audience is pretty much holding steady, 
but that as time is going by, it's going down, 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 down like this. And, and, and that if you wanted to have culture that meant something um, to a wider range of people, that you were gonna have to open up your voice to the non-art looking, um, the non-theater goers, the non-music goers, the, the people much more involved with say sport or television um, or buying electronic goods. Um, there, there is a whole other audience that we're not reaching. And so I, that, that kind of really sat with me and I began to think about how I can do that. And I'm certain I'm a painter, but in this show I have these, these videos. And those videos, within six months of making them, they were all around the world, like really fast, because they were easy to distribute, and people understood that they were on turning over kind of questions that people could relate to. So we have Jenny, who um, is of that demographic herself. <laughs> And, and so the, as the question that comes to my mind is, um, was there something that you had to overcome or did it seem natural that, that working with internet would be just your focus and your medium? Was it, was it without question or was it also a consideration for you in terms of looking at um, your peers and your generation? Um, that's actually a really good question and I'm, I'm not sure how much I, I grew up in Cupertino, and my parents both worked in a tech, tech company, so I kind of think it was just in the air, like maybe I didn't even like think about some of it, but um, oddly enough, when I was at SFAI doing my MFA, there was not a lot of, not a lot of people at the time seemed to be doing stuff with internet, like source imagery, um, kind of felt like I was the only person doing that. Um, and then I, found, I kind of found my people like later, like after I graduated. Um, and the, the more I've sort of thought about it over the years, I think what it, some of it's probably, yeah, just like I, where, how I grew up and where I grew up. But some of it is that I like finding things better than making them in general. Like I don't, I mean, th these are sort of good examples. Um, I really like collecting things or rearranging things or recontextualizing things. Like, like the dump was like my like absolute playground, you know. Um, so, uh, and I would mu I much rather do that than I just think that the things that I can find are way more interesting than anything I could ever make. Um, and it just so happens that the internet is a place where it's very easy to find things. I mean, it's not the only place you can find things, but it's a very easily accessible place. So, I think that might be why. And then I also, I'm, yeah, I'm attracted to the fact that you things do spread really quickly and there's um, people can easily access something like, yeah, like a video or, um, or an image. They don't have to go somewhere to see it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a different experience, but it is, that's remarkable. Yeah. I think one thing to um, think about, it's not either or. Um, making um, is just diversified, but I, I, I think it's a mistake to think that we're trying to replace the actual handmade qualities of things. In, in fact, um, I think it's, there's, there's a moment in time where you can actually make something and slow everything down and s kind of be with it and feel the physical qualities of it. And I, I have to do those things too, but, I, but I'm sort of, it's, for me it's like both and. and um, I think it's super important not to dichotomize that kind of conversation because it, you end up just like in this ping pong match going back and forth. So it, it's really that, that art is expansive and it's growing and it changes. And if it didn't change, it wouldn't be art, it'd be something else. Um, but I think turning it over and turning it inside out and understanding how you can use art to such a degree. I mean, I'm just struck by sitting in this show in the middle of the most difficult period for California in a long time. And, and, and before this, it was the southern uh, United States and we were having more hurricane clusters than we've had in 
many, many years. We, we have had clusters before, but there is no, I, I'm just, there is, I'm just struck by the fact that if we don't think that these are climate markers, then we are making a willing kind of head in sand thing that will make it so that our kids and your kids and the young people will never live in the world that we knew. And it maybe we were already there. I mean, I, I try to, when I'm working on my films, I work with a lot of um, teenagers and people in local areas. I've been going around the world in, in um, areas where sea level rise is gonna challenge the population. The first thing I do is I ask them, what are the young people doing? I wanna see them, I wanna talk to them. And they don't wanna think about this. And so I, my question is to you, how do you think about this? Um, at what our generation is seeing, my generation being the tail end of the baby boomer generation, um, what we're leaving, the new generation, is unspeakable. And we've already crossed a line. And the only thing we can do is try to shore up where we have um, and what we have in, in a kind of very limited way. And I hate to be so dark, but I think a lot about, um, a lot of scientists are saying this, and they're just saying it in different language. And they say it in such science language that sometimes it doesn't sink in to other people. But um, our future looks pretty hard. Our kids' future, my 16-year-old's future, looks pretty, pretty hard. And um, the kids that I've worked with, they don't want to think about that. They want to think about more upbeat things. So that's why some of the projects I make are a little bit upbeat. So I would just like to hear from you and you know, your colleagues of your generation, what, what are you guys thinking about in terms of the kind of global environment that we are looking towards? Um, thank you for asking. I'm also, I'm older than, I, I'm 31. I feel like people sometimes think I'm a lot younger than that. Um, so I'm kind of in a weird, uh, <laughs> just have to say that. Um, uh, I'm kind of like in a weird in-between point where, um, I don't know, I feel like the, I think a lot about how already by the time I was like in elementary school, like climate change was already a given, which is not, you know, um, it's like I've sort of grown up watching everything like collapse, um, and so um, I, I've seen, I've noticed two kind of interesting strains of work that among my colleagues um, that I think are coming from a related impulse. So one is I see like a ton of archiving work, which I think is a really kind of like, even if they don't realize that's why they're doing it, it's this very like sorrowful, almost like backward gazing way to make art. Like you, you archive things if you think that they're gonna be lost. So there's like the it's like a hoarding impulse. So that's one, and I that I'm kind of like in that vein. And then the and then there's also lots of um, like crazy speculative design stuff going on where people like lots of like um, sort of like sci-fi like Afrofuturism kind of like wildly trying to speculate on like new um, sort of uh, inherently impossible futures as like the only possible psychological reaction to everything totally shutting down. So I think those are those are two things, two reactions that I've seen, but I think it's an open question. Like I just yesterday spent like several hours just thinking about like what is the appropriate art to make right now? Like what is the appropriate, like obviously you can't be, you can't, you can't, okay, you obviously can't bury your head in the sand and you can't, but then you also can't be totally despairing because then you can't make anything. So like it seems like there has to be this, I'm trying to think about like how do you, be vulnerable enough to like to mourn like the things that are like going away at the, and then still be like outwardly strong enough to deal with what is still there um, and not like sort of just completely like shut down so I don't know it's, yeah. I, I like to think of this term that I've been working with is cultural adaptation and that adaptation um, in the Anthropocene um, is not just design it's not just made so that functional, so that people can live in non-inhabitable spaces that they had before. But it's also 
How can you adapt yourself to a very stark new place? And for me, looking to culture, which is art, music, dance, theater, writing, the internet, you know, how, how you look at these things philosophically, um, seems to be an important tool. I, I can only imagine the people in Puerto Rico. They have no power, yet they sing. There are these, these videos, you can see the people sitting around singing, like they, they have to do something. I don't know if you remember uh, the, the um, Balkans war and the, the cello of Sarajevo, does anyone remember that? You know, they're sitting in the rubble, the bombs are falling and the guy's playing the cello. That still sits with me. And I think you might just, that just might be the most appropriate thing is to, to kind of create work. Um, I'm, I'm producing a live show in December, December 8th and 9th, downtown Oakland. It's gonna be called Oakland Winter Live. Look for it. Um, please come. Um, it's six live performances of music, dance, theater, mixing with cinema. And I thought, well, hell, what am I gonna do in this moment that's really dark? I'm gonna make a show. I'm gonna produce a show, a live show, and it's gonna be downtown Oakland. You know, that was my way of kind of reacting. It doesn't mean that I, I don't wanna like do, like today, this morning, we took a bunch of stuff to a truck a stop and people are trucking things up to the fire victims. Um, doesn't mean you don't do those things, you do those things. But um, you, for me, I just can't, I just can't be everything all the time, and I, I, I think that culture is a solace. It's like a balm on that sore of a very dark moment, and not just in the environment, but also, you know, looking around at all of the human beings. The human, con the global human condition seems to be a big open sore right now. Um. There, there, there are a couple of points that I'd like to talk about, but the one image that came up when you speak of singing is the idea of um, slaves in fields and, you know, and even before those slaves in Roman galleys. I mean, they, they, were, they were singing, you know, and, and, and um, the combination of rising above with your voice and also the, the, the physical um, assertion of self. I mean, when you are totally constrained, that, that there's still the voice to assert the self. And I would say also, in addition to those two directions that you were talking about in terms of where people are going with their work, that identity and self-portraiture and that self-assertion also is incredibly um, vital at, at this point in time. But Kim, I'd like to um, go back to the phrase you used a while ago of um, being environmental activist. So here is my question to each, to both of you, of how, as an activist, um, you are able to either um, compartmentalize or bridge um, those activities and what drives them and how you you envision them relating to each other. I just went to see um, Michael Moore's show in New York. He got a very bad review in the New York Times, but he, he got a good review in The Voice. And I really didn't care how good his, or bad his reviews were. I just went to, I just wanted to hear him. And I went and it was so interesting because he really, he really puts everything, packs it all in. I mean, he's telling jokes, he's doing performance, he's rolling on the ground, he's being really vulnerable. Then he's like, okay, now uh, we're all gonna go to Trump Tower. Like the whole audience, like you and me and everyone. And they got all up and marched over there. And I just thought, wow, that was so, what a w overlapping, you know, how wonderful is that? Um, so what do I do? I, I guess, I think, and what he said was, if everyone did just a little, then you don't have to do a ton, but everyone has to do a little. You know, you cannot, not one person can't do anything. There is no, you know, like there's, the, there's a lot of holes and somebody's gotta fill up even with a tablespoon. 
I personally um, toggle between, I'm an educator as well, and so I toggle between getting my students all galvanized to go out there and fan out and do things like um, one of the projects that I'm sponsoring as a fiscal agent, I'm a fiscal agent sponsor nonprofit called wildprojects.org. And I sponsor a, a, a group that's called Creek College. And this is like people who go to creeks all around the United States and they do restoration and then they have a class at the creek about um, the water and the um, area and the challenges. And some of them are extreme challenges. Like imagine Appalachia, the water in that area is so disgusting. Imagine Flint, Michigan. I mean. That place, I don't know if you guys know, but there are 3,000 children that have irreversible brain damage from that water because it was so much lead. That means you, they don't get over it. They live that way. So it's like you, you just take a gesture when you can. For me, I think as an educator, it's the best way, but other, there are other things that I'm doing. Um, with other people when I when I get a chance and and then you know you take time off and you do your work you know you you can only I think I've I've actually tried to be a force of um, humane resistance since I was a teenager and you have to take breaks and then you do other things now's a time where everyone shouldn't take too much of a break Um, so I, right now, currently, it's sort of divided between, like, I've been writing a lot more, so I don't know if I can call myself, like, I'm not, I don't know if I can call myself an activist, just out of respect to people who are actual activists and do that kind of work, um, but I definitely have, like, a politics that shows up in my work and also in my teaching, um, so, and, and more so in my writing lately, like, I just wrote a very long essay called How to Do Nothing, um, that sounds very apolitical, but it's kind of like making this case for, um, uh, or it's, it's about how people's time has now been sort of colonized by like the idea that everyone is there, everyone is an entrepreneur. So especially for people my age, like every minute you could be potentially be like working on your personal brand, uh, you know, or, and I see it with my students cause you know, they're Stanford students. So it's like, everything is like, well, why am I doing this? Well, why am I doing this? Well, why am I, it's like, <laughs> you know, like, um, it's, does it lead you know, to something? Yeah. Or like, I'm just, I can see them going down that road and then, and then getting, you know, working at Facebook and being 35 and having this like horrible crisis. Like, Oh my God, I've never actually had like an independent thought. Um, so, uh, I'm trying, trying to, um, like push against that at least in, in, uh, my writing and teaching, like my, I teach the, it's, it used to be design one and now it's called intro to digital slash physical design. And all the students come in thinking that it's going to be like the D school kind of design thinking, like post-its on windows kind of thing. Um, and our field trip is just a hike. Cause I think it should be a hike. Like I, you know, like I, or like the small things, like, like I had them do a project about graphic, or they have to research a graphic designer, and I tried as hard as I could to make the list be diverse, which is really hard because the history of graphic design is super white and male. So, um, so yeah, there's just kind of like, uh, I, I, I guess I have like a different, like, like I make, I think some of that shows up in my work, but I think maybe more so like lately in my writing and just small decisions that I make as a teacher. I, I think that's really also very interesting that there's this common denominator with the artists here that you teach and Kim teaches. And Clifford, who has lost everything, has found his solace, I think, with his students at CCA right now. So yesterday he was teaching. And, um, you know, also, Chester is a beloved teacher also at College of Marin, and um, the, the, the commitment to change um, also is really faith in, in the future and the next generation also, and in passing the torch and, and sort of lighting away first. And, um, but I, I look at this exhibition and I think of Paul Koss, you know, very rooted to the land and to 
um, what man has done to it, in his case, his early videos with mining, um, coming from a, a background um, of mining families. His grandfather was a miner, and his father, as a doctor, treated miners with black lung. And, um, so this awareness that uh, informs the work, and the work in a very poetic way, I think this is very interesting, also in a very poetic way addressing these issues. So I, I'd like to know how you feel about um, the aesthetics of representing these ideas, of having an agenda, but at the same time making work that transcends that as well in some ways, so that um, you in fact are still involved in, in art that is, you know, be, it transcends our time or a limited time or a limited um, event or action. I think that, um, I think I made a conscious decision to want to make art of my time, but, because she brings up transcending time, but I think there is, there is this interesting toggle between something that la that's lasting, that can recontextualize itself and be mutable, and, and that's something that is perhaps touching some, uh, for we still think about formal ideas and, composition and, and color and saturation and in the case of video time and and narrative and non-narrative and push against the narrative there's all kinds of structural things that we're constantly looking at and thinking about my new project that I'm making is going to be like a mosaic of videos of nature that is small creatures and and also pieces of landscape and I think that we still are visual creatures and, and audio, you know, we're really interested. I like, I love the echo of the, of the microphone, you know, there's something, you know, I really like that, you know. Um, and, and those things can be detached from content in a certain way. But, but in the end, it's the final experience of something. And for me, like, the, when a work of art is effective, it exists on a multitude of levels, kind of simultaneously. Is it, how is it being experienced visually, auditorially, in its context, in its time, and all those, those things come into play. And I still wanna to touch those things. I'm, it's not like I, I don't wanna have any of those things, of course I do. Um, seducing a viewer and an audience, the seduction of an audience, requires something. It requires some kind of experience that, that like you said, is transcendent or shocking or uh, enveloping, you know, something that's kind of philosophic, that's intellectual. It makes you think a lot of things and feel a lot of things simultaneously. Those things are aesthetics in my mind. Um, I think that for me, just working more with landscape than I, these are some, these are works, well, two of these are from a while ago, and I've sort of been working more directly with um, plants, specifically getting very obsessed with identifying plants. Um, but uh, I think just by virtue of working with landscape, you're or, you already, I don't know, at least like I find there's already inherently a timelessness about that. That's why I'm attracted to it. It's like a, it helps. It's a way of inhabiting a different scale of time. Um, so, like for instance, last uh, two months ago, I went to the um, Cascade Siskiyou National Monument um, to write about it for uh, SF MoMA Open Space, and I and they had crazy fires going on up there also. Um, but there is a uh, I can't remember something million year old, 25 million year old rock called Pilot Rock up there that you can see from really far away when you're driving on I-5. Um, and I, I hiked up to it, and then I kind of went as far up it as I possibly, like, that's smart to go when you're by yourself. Um, and uh, I just sat on it, and I sat on it for the longest time because it just, like, it was very reassuring to me, like this really old rock, and it's just gonna be there, it's been there, it will continue to be there. 
Um, I mean, it's obviously changing, but at this rate, that's completely imperceptible to me. Like, I'm finding myself uh, especially, and that's a lot of what How to Do Nothing was about, is af since the election, I've been, I've needed that a lot more. Like, something sort of real to grab onto that it is, yeah, can help me inhabit some other kind of perspective on reality. Um, and also, I just have to mention that um, the, uh, the other thing that was in How to Do Nothing uh, is an account of these crows that I, they're not my pets, but um, they're not not my pets. Um, they, I, I had just read this book about how birds are really smart um, and crows are especially smart and they can recognize human faces for many years. Um, if they really like you, they'll bring you stuff sometimes. Um, like shiny things. Um, and so I, since March, I've um, just put some, like a couple peanuts like out on my balcony and there's a f family of crows that now comes like every day, kind of around the same time. Um, yeah, and I like, I when I go on trips, I like get worried about them and I miss them. And, um, and I spend a lot of time staring at them just, and the more I look, you know, crows are a very common bird, but the more I look at them, so specific crows, I'm just like, they just become more mysterious. Like, I don't know where they live. I don't know what they do the rest of the day, but I see them, you know, like flying around. And then now it's like the later part of the year. So they're kind of starting to join up with bigger groups and do the thing where like a bunch of crows fly around in the afternoon. But um, that has been hugely therapeutic to me just because I just to temporarily like I'll never know what it's like to be a crow but I'm sort of trying to place myself like in their animal perspective on like my neighborhood I've I've noticed that in looking at them now I'm more aware of what different kinds of trees are on my hill the shape of the hill like be just by virtue of them like flying around and landing in the different trees so um, I think that might be why I'm uh, it's sort of a weird answer to your question, but that might be why I'm as a person I'm just attracted to working with um, elements of like landscape and animals and plants is just for that kind of very almost like survival reason, it's like psychological survival. Yeah. yeah. How many people have the wild turkeys running around in your yard? Uh, they are They're all so over awesome. in Berkeley. They're, and I, I'm tempted to say that those crows are spending their days um, keeping away the blue jays, the seagulls, um, occupying the road so that the cars stay away, and dive bombing us, you know, as we uh, try and get to our front doors. <laughs> it was like, yeah. crows. But um, I, I did want to give. Um, Everyone here, a chance if you have some questions, some things you'd like to talk about. Yes, let me bring the, the mic over to you, Edith. And um, um, yesterday, I went to MoMA and saw the Walker Evans show. And Walker Evans, of course, did the Depression, and he did the farm workers. And he did a number of really social issues. He worked for a government organization to do this. He also did all kinds of cultural things that people do that are very, very simple. He loved, evidently, according to the, um, the publications by the museum, he loved neighborhood idiosyncrasies. And he did a series of photographs of outside grocery stores in New York City, in the lower part of New York City. And the museum has taken these, and they have projected them in a little screen so that you get into the photograph deeper simply because the digital version gives you more color and light. And the thing that struck me when I was looking at these photographs was that Caravaggio could not have done a better job in the beautiful, beautiful value pattern shapes and the gorgeous photography 
So your idea of putting these two things or maybe multiple things together, I think is really important. It's a beautiful show and I really recommend it. Um, this is about your crows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I went to visit a friend of mine um, in Palo Alto, and it's sort of, um, there's a lot of Silicon Valley, these gigantic mansions, and she's in this part of Palo Alto, that, and her house is one of these small, older houses that used to be in Palo Alto. Anyway, um, so she's planted all these trees, and she's kind of homeward bound, home, homebound, because she has all these kind of health problems. Anyway, so uh, she has a lot of entertainments at home. And so she has these crows who are friends that come visit and um, they bring things and they drop them and they, you know, they put them there. And so she has a little container of all these things that the crows have brought. And then, um, and squirrels also are her friends. So also, she has these um, collection of rocks that, and I mean, she's, she's a writer, but she doesn't, just on the counter, her kitchen counter, she didn't say anything about these. And I go over and here are these rocks on her counter. And she says, well, all these rocks have faces in them. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them I think the, the crows have brought, but, um, you know, it's about your thing of finding, finding st things. And um, also about um, certain um, kind of, a kind of permanency, you know, that is, does not seem like it's happening now. But... Um, Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> I have one quick one and one longer one. Uh, the quick one is, uh, where will we be able to read How to Do Nothing? Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. And, and for both of you, um, I am a currently invisibly disabled person with limited resources and energy, but I am an amateur artist and an, and an amateur writer. Uh, used to be a tech writer in the computer industry. Um, do, you, do either of you have any thoughts about how a person in my situation, an, an amateur artist with limits on uh, what one can contribute, effective places to plug in and help. Is that on in environmental issues? Mm. Well, there's so many. Um, it, it, I guess you would have to see like what you could do at home, you know, from your home. So you, because you're not, you know, feeling that well to go out and run around. Um, but there's, there's a whole list actually on the back of my website, wildprojects.org, under links. I have a whole list of organizations that I think are really important organizations that, that one can get involved with that I would send you there first. Um, and then check them out, read about them, and then see where you best fit. I mean, I think they, if they don't, they need them, and and they, you know what I mean. Sometimes in the environment, like I don't know if you guys have been to that Bioneers conference. Anybody been to that a conference? The art in that conference really needs a lot of help. I've tried to write to those people like a million times. There's a lot going on in contemporary art. They should come here, you know. Like they, they just don't are not aware. I think there's a thing about environmentalism. And, and the activists that really don't understand that artists are parallel animals doing the same 
kind of content, and there needs to be bridges made. So you sound like a really smart person. We're looking for bridges between the environmental organizations and artists who could actually drive the conversation very visually and very fast. And I think that we, are, we have yet to kind of really get our synapses together. And um, I'm hoping that that will change. So creating dialogue between these kind of organizations and artists and arts organizations would be helpful. And you could even write a letter, hey, did you see this list of links of arts organizations? Hey, this is a list of environmental, you know, somewhere even start at the beginning. We need bridges made. And I, I also think if you're a writer, that's so important because a lot of artists don't see themselves as writers. And to be able to, um, you know, communicate that way and disseminate is really important also, really, really important. Is there someone? Hi, I'm just curious, how did you, what informed you, Jenny, to use the internet as a resource for your work? Um, it's a little bit of what I was saying earlier about just, it's, you can find a lot of stuff there, um, but then I think later on, um, it kind of just, um, it's, it's also, a, it's not, I hesitate to say it's a really good research tool. I I hesitate just because I know like my students think it's the only research tool, and that really bothers me. They're like right next door to an amazing library, and they like never go inside. Um, but for instance, things like um, so this piece where I was trying to find out where things were made. Um, it's actually not for things that were made recently. It's not very easy to do um, because a lot of companies don't are not very forthcoming about where they're actually getting things, um, and so. The, um, I've sort of become, well for this project then also what I ended up doing at the dump, I had to become this like internet spelunker kind of where you start with one page and then you kind of like, I spent a lot of time on Alibaba which is like a, it's like the, so, not a social network, it's a, it's where if you are like a Chinese factory you have a profile there and then other people like wholesalers will go and look at your thing. Um, so I'd you know, go to, spend a lot of time on Alibaba. I would end up looking at strange like factory audit PDFs that I think like company, company doesn't realize is online, like uh, people's like employee reviews of working in a factory, like just lots of like odd kind of um, sources of information um, and then trying to tie those together and then ideally it ends up with an, you end up at an address and that is the address of the factory. But it, it, it's funny because you think that you can just Google something and you either find it or you don't. But through this project specifically, where I was trying to find out where things were made, um, I realized that it is possible to Google something for two days. <laughs> and, and only at the end of the two days will you find your answer. Um, so I think that, the, and that's something that I used a lot also when I was at the dump. I researched the manufacturing origins of 200 objects that I found there. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's the type of research that you really, I think you really need the internet for. So it's not, I, I always try to emphasize that my work is not about the internet and I'm actually kind of moving away from it lately. Um, it's just that it has been the most useful tool for the things that I've wanted to do up until now. One of, one of the things that relates to this that I think is key is also um, the point that um, misrepresentation is just everywhere, so that if something um, is represented as having been made here, it could be that every single component came from some other place, so that polluting production actually happened, you know, all over the world, and then it was actually just assembled here. And so that misrepresentation, I think, is also common um, in, in many areas in terms of um, what we um, are told and what we're not told and how things are um, framed for us. In that sense, you had a question? Oh, can I actually, can I just add one thing to that? Well, two things. One, there was something that I found in the dump that was a CD drive from 2001 that was completely, it looked like it had been run over by a truck and it was like muddy. 
and it said made in the US, but it had, because it had been smushed, you could just pull the plastic cover off and it was like a drive that was made in Taiwan, like inside this like plastic. I was like, okay, like the plastic was made in the US, I guess. Um, and, but that was just such a, like, a metaphor for everything. Um, and then uh, recently, um, so the, the project that I did at the dump, it's called the Bureau of Suspended Objects, and it's a one-person bureau, and the only thing the bureau does is try to find out where things were made. And recently, the bureau researched this watch that someone gave me, so I now collect pre-trash from people, like it's something you're gonna throw away anyway, and it's this horrible, cheap watch. I mean, you pick it up, it's like this completely loathsome object. It's like the cheapest thing you've ever felt. Um, and he got it from, um, there's these watch ads on Instagram that like everyone I know has seen these ads where it's this very like modernist looking watch and then it says it's free for a limited time, you just pay for shipping. And then obviously they're just, it's a, probably a dollar watch and they're making all the money off of shipping, which that's not new. But when I try, I started looking into that Instagram account, the company that sold it is called Folsom and Company, it claims to be in San Francisco and has very like hipster San Francisco aesthetic. But then and it says that it's in Soma, it's a watch startup in Soma. And it has a picture of a building that implies that that's their headquarters. But it's actually a ping pong social club that was founded by Susan Sarandon last year. Um, and then the, the description of the neighborhood is copy pasted from um, sanfrancisco.com neighborhood descriptions. And then I like started reverse Google image searching things and it turns out that there are all these clone websites that I think are run by the same person that use the same exact web template. There's one in Miami, there's one in London, there's one in New York, and they're all like, all of their storefront photos are stock images where they've put like a fake logo on it. And it just like, just turned into this like crazy rabbit hole. Um, and uh, it was just like, I'm sort of used to that a little bit with like looking at where things are made, but oh yeah. It's not unlike when you go to New York and you try to buy a pair of shoes and you go to West 8th, and then you realize all the shoe stores are the same. They just run the shoes up on all the storefronts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I want to say just one thing um, before you go. There is my videos on the other side of that wall. So and we're if you ever get a chance um, to see these, these pieces, I just want to let you know because it's behind a wall. You might not know that. We, we are going to turn them on again. We turned them off for the volume and the recording of this session, but we're going to turn them on right after we end. I did want to say one thing about um, about uh, a, an earlier point that you'd made, Kim, and I, I think that it's really clearly um, there in your videos. In, that's the quality of holding and slowing down time. And I think when we look at Kim's videos, we look and we know what's coming next. We know that um, degradation continues. We know that the waters are gonna keep rising and we are just locked in that, that visual and we are mesmerized by it. It is um, really uh, entrancing in, in a way. And I think um, that this is you know, the power of, of the work. And also, it, it speaks in another way to how, unfortunately, we can know things and still inertia can hold us from moving on. And I, I think, I hope that um, it, this is all a terrible time, terrible disaster, and um, I just hope that um, that we will move on from this in a in in a sounder way. All of us, in every little bit, as you said, every little bit, and um, and keep working towards the bigger things too that um, may seem beyond us. So I, I want to thank you both for being with us today, for sharing your wonderful work with us, for making this incredible work. I think um, our other artists who are not here and who are really hurting deeply. Um, I hope that if um, this is the first time you've come to the Richmond Art Center, that you will come again, come often. For those of you who are our valued members and supporters, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to point out that at this juncture, um, as we are donation-based, um, 
we are taking our donation box to help support Clifford. Uh, we thank you just very much for joining us under these circumstances, especially. Thank you. Thank you.